to provide for you. I'm going to give you a crown of beauty. I'm going to give you the oil of gladness. And I'm going to give you a garment of praise. Now, what's your job? You have to take off the what you got on now so you can put on what he's got for you. The crown of beauty, the belt of truth, the garments of praise. Each has been bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. Hello and welcome to Destined for Victory with Pastor Paul Shepard. You know, everything you need to walk in spiritual victory is already hanging in your closet. You don't have to buy anything, borrow anything, or beg for anything. All you have to do is put them on. Stay with us now as Pastor Paul moves ahead in his teaching series, The Jabez Journey. Or visit us at PastorPaul.net to listen to any recent message on demand, including the one you'll hear in just a moment. That's PastorPaul.net. And don't forget, for on-demand access, you can download or subscribe to the podcast at Spotify or wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Now, with today's Destined for Victory message in need of a supersized blessing, here is Pastor Paul. First Chronicles chapter four, verses nine and 10. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. We've been focusing on Jabez's mother's ill-advised decision to name her son after the traumatic experience of childbirth. And we've been discussing better ways to handle our trauma than what we see in her life. We've talked about the fact that we should remember that God's grace is sufficient. We've also talked in the last message about the fact that we must learn to speak words of faith and conviction. In the last message, I talked extensively about our need to change the way many of us talk. We talk doubt. We talk defeat. We talk confusion. We talk misery. And we need to learn to speak words of faith and conviction, even when we're dealing with a trauma. You say, well, I'm still in the traumatic experience, so how am I going to speak positively in the midst of it? Well, you don't always have to talk about where you are, but learn to talk about where you're going. If I'm in the thick of something I don't like, I don't have to rehearse what I'm in. I can rehearse where I'm going. And say, I am in this trouble now, but the Lord is going to deliver me. The Lord is going to bring me through and bring me out. So we talked about that. Now I want to talk about one more way we should handle our trauma just briefly. And then I want to move on and start focusing on verse 10. Where we will spend the rest of this brief series. But the third way we can handle our trauma better is to build an altar of adoration rather than a monument to misery. Build an altar of adoration rather than a monument to misery. A lot of us are in the habit of creating monuments to our misery. We're good at describing our misery and crafting our misery and packaging it. Some folk market their misery. You actually mark it and ship it out to other folk. Some of you have email groups and you just ship them the latest update on your misery. Just thought I'd tell y'all how jacked up I am this week. I don't know about you, but I get some of them every now and then. Just folk just marketing their misery. Now listen, be clear. It's fine to have folk that pray with you and say, here's what I'm going through. I need you who love me to pray for me. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not the kind of email I'm talking about. I'm not talking about folks seeking prayer and, and walking in faith. I'm talking about folk who just want you to know how jacked up they are. And they're not asking for help. They're not asking for prayer. They're not asking for anything like that. They just want you to know, here, I'm tired of knowing this by myself. I want y'all to know. Listen, we need to learn to build an altar of adoration to our God. Why? Because he's the one 
who promises to get us through what we're going through. He's the one that'll bring you out. When you're in the valley of the shadow of death, you got to learn the only way I'm getting out of here is the Lord is with me and his rod and staff are going to comfort me. And meanwhile, even while I'm in the valley, he's preparing a place for me. And he's going to prepare a table. And when he brings me out of this valley, he's going to sit me down at a table of provision and blessing. And I'm going to get to eat in the very presence of my enemies. And so we have to learn to build an altar of adoration. We got to learn to replace complaining with praise. We got to learn to replace it. Just swap. I'm used to murmuring, but now I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm used to complaining, but now I'm going to give God the glory. If I can't glorify him for what I'm in, I can glorify him for where he's taking me. Now, let me establish this from scripture. In Isaiah 61, that passage that was fulfilled in the coming of Christ. In fact, when you read Luke 4 in the Gospels, he got up and he read the scriptures. And what did he read? He read Isaiah 61. One of the phrases in that passage is that God promised that he would provide for those who grieve in Zion. He would bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. He would give them the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Watch this. And he would give them a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Jesus read that from Isaiah 61 as he stood in the synagogue that day. Then he closed the scriptures, gave it back to the minister, and he said to the people, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He said, I'm here, and what Isaiah talked about hundreds of years ago is being fulfilled right now before your very eyes. Why? Because I've shown up now, and I am the one who is going to do all of these things in your life. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give you a crown of beauty. I'm going to give you the oil of gladness, and I'm going to give you a garment of praise. Now, what's your job? You have to take off the what you got on now so you can put on what he's got for you. Say, well, God hasn't given me a garment of praise. Well, look what you got on. When you go to the store and you see an outfit and say, whoo, that is what I, oh, I can't wait to see myself in that. I think I'm going to be the bomb in this. What do you have to do? You can't just admire it on the rack. You have to take it off the rack, make sure it's your size now. (laughs) Come on, don't deceive yourself. Come on, please. I try to help you in practical ways. Don't go to the store and jack yourself up. (laughs) Go look at the size. Is this mine? I don't care how cute it is. If it says eight and you haven't been in single digits in 17 years... then you don't even bother going in there. You're going to discourage yourself. Trying to help you. Go to the lady, say, listen, do you have this in whatever your number is? And remember what I tell you, if it's for you, God will have it there for you. If they don't have it, say, well, call around. Does your store in this city or that city have it? You know, do a little investigation. Oh, I've shopped for my wife at different points throughout our our marriage. And I know how to do it. I've worked it. I can work a Macy's. I can work a Nordstrom. I can work uh, a Nemus. I I know how to work them. I said, well, she would really love this now. If you don't have this in her side, call your store over there. And they pick up the phone and call. And I said, if they have it, I said, all right, tell them to hold it for me. My name is Shepard. Tell them I'll be over there. You got to work the system now. But the point is, you get something that fits you, but what do you have to do? You have to go in the changing room and you have to take off what you got on before you can put on what you hope to take home. Look at what you have on. You have on a spirit of despair, a spirit of heaviness. You got on a garment of complaints, a garment of misery. And some of you, you've been wearing it so long, you don't even know what it would be like to take it off. But today, the word of God challenges you. 
take that garment off, strip down before God. Say, Lord, I'm sick of being miserable. I'm sick of being full of despair and discouragement and heaviness. I'm tired of my life this way. Give me that garment that you promised me. And God will slip you into his room and put on that garment of praise. And you know what the Bible says about praise in one place? David said, praise is comely to the upright. That's the language of King James. You know what that means? That means praise looks good on saved folk. When you come out and look in the mirror and turn, you know how y'all do. Turn, look at the back, see how it's hitting you in the back. Sideways. Praise look good on you no matter what angle you hit. No matter where you're looking, praise look good. Folk around you start saying, girl, you look sharp. Say, where'd you get that? I went to Isaiah 61. I went to Isaiah 61. Where that store? That's where you get the garment of praise, but you have to take off what you have on first. Up next, the second half of today's Destined for Victory message with Pastor Paul Shepard. He's Senior Pastor, Destiny Christian Fellowship in Fremont, California. Listen to any recent Destined for Victory message wherever you go by downloading our free mobile app. This app allows you to order resources from our online store. You can contact us for prayer or make a safe and secure donation to the ministry all through the app. Search Destined for Victory in the App Store. Well, it's always better to live life through the windshield and not the rearview mirror. Don't look back. You're not going that way. With the rest of today's Destined for Victory message in need of a supersized blessing, here once again is Pastor Paul Shepard. Paul said in the New Testament, Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Then he said, I will say it again, rejoice. He's being emphatic. He's telling the church at Philippi. Now, he's not writing from the rich Carlton. He's not in a suite. He's not hanging out, having a wonderful time. He is in jail when he writes to the church at Philippi. He is in jail. He's in prison. But you know what theologians call uh, Philippians? They call it Paul's joy book. Because the book is full of joy. When you read Philippians, it's just he is praising God every chance he gets. And he is passing on the praise and passing it around and encouraging folk at every turn. And he's in jail. You know why? Because your circumstances don't have to determine how you act. He knows what it is to put on the garment of praise. He's already taken off the spirit of despair. And he says to the church in 4 and 4 Philippians, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You know what that means? That means you have to do the rejoicing. He didn't say, well, just hope one day that the Spirit of God hits you and you go to dancing. No, that's not what he said. He said, you make the choice to rejoice. Just like you make the choice to complain. Just like you make the choice to be full of despair and discouragement and despondent. And soon as somebody asks you how you doing, they are in for it. You ever met somebody like that? You ask them how they're doing, you better have some time on your hands. Because they're going to tell you in painful detail. No, no. Paul said, learn to make the choice to rejoice. So I want to let you know, we can build altars of adoration. David put it this way, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Volition. He's talking about choices he's making. If you want to live a better life, make better choices. I said, if you want to live a better life, make better choices. Quit waiting for a better life to be determined by your circumstances. Determine that you're going to have a better life by the way you act in life. It's a good message. I'm going to get this CD myself. (laughs) Now, let's turn our attention to verse 10. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me. Some of your translations say indeed. Pause right there. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. The Hebrew construction of this verse is downright fascinating to me. When you look at this verse in an interlinear Bible or something that helps you see sort of the Hebrew breakdown What you find is 
Jabez cried out to the Lord and said, oh, that you will bless me, bless me. Jabez, he used the word twice. He used a second form of the same word. Oh, that you will bless me, bless me. And in the Hebrew, what that construction means is Jabez said, Lord, I don't just need a regular blessing. Where I am in my life at this point, Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm crying out to you. I'm depending on you to give me a tremendous blessing. He said, oh, that you would bless me, bless me. The best way for us to to recreate the meaning of the Hebrew here is to think about what happens in certain fast food chains where when you you say, I want a number three meal or whatever the number is up on the screen, very often they will ask you, do you want small, medium, or large? And you say, I I want the number three. I mean... No, no, that's not what they ask you. They know you want number three, but they offer number three in a smaller form, meaning you get the sandwich or whatever the, the main thing is, but you also get a side, typically fries if it's a fast food place, and a drink. They say you can get a small one, small fries, small drink with the number three main course, or you can get a medium size. That's a bigger thing of fries, bigger drink. Or you can get a large. That's a big, big thing of fries. Big drink. In fact, one chain used to, I don't know if they still do, but they used to call it super size. Y'all with me, y'all with me. (laughs) Jabez said, Lord, bless me and supersize it. That's exactly what he did. He said, Lord, I need a super size. I can't use a regular blessing at this point in my life. I appreciate your regular blessings, but Lord, where I am right now, I need a super size blessing. Anybody ever been there? Where what you need from God, no, no, the or- I-, I can't use the ordinary size. I'm too hungry for the ordinary size. Bless me, supersize it, please. That's what Jabez pulled up to the window and asked God for. When God said, may I help you? Jabez said, yes, uh, may I have a blessing and would you supersize it? That's exactly what's going on in the Hebrew. I'm not putting that in there. It's in there, which is why many English translations, the only way they can grab it is they put the word indeed in. He didn't use a separate word. He used the same word twice, asking for the super size. So in our language, we just said, indeed. If you get a homeboy translation, they'd probably say, bless me big time. (laughs) You know, it's the kind of stuff we say in our vernacular. (laughs) Bless me big time. Bless me seriously. Give me the blessing that is the largest size available. That's what Jabez is asking for. He wants out of this cycle of pain. He wants out of the misery. He wants out of carrying the heavy baggage of being known through all of his life to this point as somebody who causes pain. He doesn't want that association anymore. What Jabez shows us in the way he cries out to God are two things. First, He shows us that he was determined not to allow his past to dictate his future. He was determined not to allow his past to dictate his future. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to make up our minds that the past is the past. Whatever is in your past that has created baggage, created trouble, uh, created problems, you can't help your past. Your past is your past. It's history. It's unchangeable. But thank God. Your past does not have to determine or dictate your future. Thank God that what has been, has been. That's over. Water under the bridge. But God is saying, in effect, now what do you want to do? Now where can I take you? Now how will you let me bless you? 
and you don't have to be dictated to from behind. This is a day, saith the Lord, when you and I have to stop driving looking in the rear view mirror. Because nobody can get where they're going safely looking in the rear view mirror. That's there for a quick reference. When you have a rear view mirror in your car, that's for a quick reference so you can know what's coming up behind you so that you can know if you're going to change lanes. You can see if there's somebody approaching in the lane you want to get into and you can make your adjustment accordingly. But nobody gets in the car and puts it in drive and then starts peering at the rear view mirror and you spend your whole time driving looking in the rear view mirror. You're going to have an accident. And if that's true in your driving experience, why wouldn't it be true much more so in your life? Some of us are getting nowhere quickly, at least nowhere good, because we're spending our lives talking about what happened. Rear view mirror, past is dictating. Negative experiences, dictating. Look at the generation that Moses was called to deliver from Egypt. You know all that God did to show them his power. Do you know why it was so difficult for Pharaoh to finally let God's people go? Because God made it difficult. When you read it, and it keeps talking about Pharaoh hardening his heart, there are times strategically in Exodus where it clarifies. It says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. You have noticed that? The Lord, every now and then, Pharaoh would have given up and God said, nope, and hardened his heart. And suddenly Pharaoh became stubborn and said, I don't care what you do, care what plague you just sent. I'm not letting them go. Why would God say, I'm going to deliver you from this bondage and then harden the heart of the guy who's keeping you in bondage? Why? Because he wanted Israel to know how great a God he was. If you are having trouble letting go of the past today, take some advice from the Apostle Paul who had a checkered past of his own. But one thing I do, he wrote in Philippians 3, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If you need prayer today for any reason, please visit PastorPaul.net and use the contact feature to share your request with us. While you're there, be sure to scroll down to the bottom of the homepage and request Pastor Paul's monthly letter of encouragement, which comes at no cost or obligation. You know, anytime we hear from someone who has been blessed by Pastor Paul's teaching, a prison inmate who came to faith in Christ through the Destined for Victory program, an elderly shut-in who can't make it to church on Sundays, we always have friends like you to thank. Because without you, there would be no us. Your prayers and financial support are the lifeblood of this ministry, and we're so grateful to have you standing with us. As you're able to make a generous donation today, we'd like to bless you with an outstanding resource on spiritual warfare. It's called This Is How I Fight My Battles. Pastor Paul has spent many hours putting this booklet together, and it's something every believer in Christ needs to read. Make no mistake, we are at war with an unseen enemy. And this booklet shows you not only how to engage in this battle, but how to win it. That's This Is How I Fight My Battles, and it's our gift to you when you make your generous donation to Destined for Victory. Call us at 855-339-5500 or visit PastorPaul.net to make a safe and secure donation online. You can also mail your gift to Destined for Victory, Post Office Box 1767, Fremont, California, 94538. After God did all of that, they still don't make the promised land. Why? Because as soon as they got over there, they started complaining, building monuments of misery. That's next time when Pastor Paul shares his message in need of a supersized blessing. Until then, remember, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. In Christ, you are destined for victory. Victory.